Andy. Okay. Okay, welcome to the uh, Principia College students interns, uh, summer interns. And I'm going to introduce Susie and Andy and Gabe, and they'll talk a little bit about themselves. And I'll just tell you a little bit about who's sponsoring their, um, this summer internship. It's a, an institute at Principia College that is studying the interface between quantum physics and classical physics and also quantum physics interpretations, and it's called the Institute for the Metaphysics of Physics. So there's a little bit of metaphysician in the students. Uh, that's one of the things that is studied at Principia College. And uh, now there's the quantum physics component. So IMOP, as it's called, is sponsoring these students. And we'll start out with Susie. I have a mic already, but thank you. OK. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Susie Bonwich, and I'm from the great city of St. Louis, Missouri. And I attend Principia College, which is right across the river in southern Illinois. So today, I'm going to be talking about a piece of the institute that a lot of people don't realize is there until the lack of that piece uh, affects them. And so as all the other interns are kind of studying engineering and physics and aspects of science, my passion is business. So I've been focusing on the business side of the Institute. So here are some of my interests, uh, just the components of business, marketing, finance, accounting, management, and operations, and fundraising. And I also am you know, an amateur at figuring out stuff about astronomy and meteorology. So I do understand a little bit about science. And then if you guys really wanted to know, I'm interested in cats. So I have my cats in space lanyard, so it kind of connects. And so those are my interests. Ever since high school, I've been interested in business. I've been a manager at a restaurant for four years now. And it's just fascinating to me to get to understand the, the inner workings of a for-profit organization. But I've also been fascinated in fundraising, which I've done in high school and in college. And so being able to know more about nonprofits has also been an interest of mine. And so when I heard that there was an internship here at the Institute for Business, I immediately wanted to apply, because not only would it give me that hands-on experience to learn about a nonprofit, but it's also just the information that the SETI Institute's involved with is so compelling that I knew that I would have a really fun time being here. My mentor is Karen Randall, who's the special, or the special, the director of special projects, which put very simply uh, is that she works to advance the Institute in any way possible. There's many different aspects to it, so it's not really a simple position, but uh, very important. And though her background has been extensive in management consulting and entrepreneurial ventures is kind of intimidating when I first came, it's been a joy working with her. And I've learned so much about business in general, nonprofits, and then specifically the SETI Institute. So to get started, the Drake Equation, which everyone at the Institute should know what it is. And if they don't, then you better get to know what it is. Uh, Basically, the way I look at it is just all these variables together, which then equal n, which all I know is uh, the total amount of civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy whose electromagnetic emissions are detectable. And I got that down, and that was what's on the website. So every scientist here, as you guys know, are probably researching some part of this equation. A key goal of the SETI Institute is to find any information to help us better understand each one of these. And so I thought, if someone were to ask me what part of the equation I'm helping out, I was like, well, how am I going to answer that? All I had to really do is just tweak it a little bit. And since I've been here for nine weeks, I thought I had the authority to do so. So I haven't asked Frank Drake yet, but I'm pretty sure that he'll approve it. And that's the last one right at the end. <laughs> F sub dollar sign, which is just the funds required in order to accomplish our mission. Um, because as you guys are really deep in analyzing data and in your research, you forget that the Institute's a corporation and you need money in order to keep on running. And while it is a nonprofit, so the money is not the priority, that's why I put it at the end of the equation. I don't want anyone else to think, oh, well, the money's the most important. It's not, but it's still a, a crucial factor to the survival of the Institute. And so that's what I've been studying is just how we run as a business. So I'm going to talk a little bit just about the difference between nonprofits and for-profits, and then um, go on to kind of the necessities for success in a nonprofit, and also individually as you guys are scientists moving on in your careers. 
So nonprofits and for-profits, differences. The name says it all. A for-profit is just a company or something that's established in order to generate money, whereas a nonprofit is wanting to fill some kind of need, whether it's humanitarian, environmental. So an example would be the ASPCA's need that it's filling is helping save little animals and protecting, um, protecting these animals. And for the institute, the need is, you could say, astronomical. Ah, get it, astronomy. But anyway, um, so it's that need to understand the universe, the need to get this knowledge to understand what's going, out, going on out in space. So that's what makes it a nonprofit. And so similarities between for-profits and nonprofits, there are several. But one that's really important is that need for organization. Because we are a business, we need to run as one. And so these are three acronyms that help with kind of organization that you can use, uh, kind of looking at the institute as a whole, individual projects, or even yourself. And so the SWOT and the SOAR analyses are kind of, you use them to weigh options, see what's worth doing. And so SWAT, as you can see, is strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and it should be threats, not strengths. So, but you know, the more strengths you have, the better, I guess. Um, and so you see, do my strengths um, outweigh my weaknesses? Do my opportunities outweigh my threats? It's a great way to organize something before you actually dive in and do something and realize the hard way, well, maybe that wasn't worth doing and now I've put all this time and effort into something. And similar with the SOAR. For SMART, it's more um, kind of putting your plans, if you're a freelance scientist or you're wanting to convince someone to invest in you, they're gonna want to know specifically what you're doing. It'd be great if the mission or your just overall goal would be enough for them to support you, but they're gonna wanna know more. And so it's important that you're specific, exactly what are you doing, uh, you figure out how you're gonna measure your results, you t what actions are you gonna take, is it realistic, and how long is it gonna take for them to see any kind of um, uh, result. So these are the necessities for success, specifically for a nonprofit. They work for for-profits too, but what I find are really important that you focus on, especially if you're a nonprofit. And so we kind of touched on a little bit of organization. I'll have a little bit after this slide. Uh, the importance of a really solid mission statement, uh, offering value, having passion, and having effective communication. So this is something that was introduced to me over the summer by Peter Drury, who does uh, organization stuff like this, and this is a kind of a management dashboard. And this is specifically for fundraising, but you can kind of create it to your own needs if you have other goals that you want to take care of. And so it has the retention rate, engagement index, median gift size, non-ask ratio, new donor number, brand strength rating, and future commitment. And if you don't know all of these, that's okay. The ones that are kind of a medium gray, I would say are the most important, and they're probably the most straightforward, being retention rate, median gift, new donor, and future. One side note is that I thought that was interesting is the median gift size, because a lot of people will ask, well, what's your average gift size? And with uh, large donations, that skews the average gift size, so it's actually more accurate to ask for the median gift size to get a more uh, realistic number. And so I kind of have an analogy to help describe this. I hope you guys will stick with me while I try to explain this. Uh, we're all gardeners. So if you look at the Institute as a gardener, uh, the soil is pretty much everything that the Institute has to offer. The information, the scientists, like the research, it's all in that nutrient-rich soil. And the first thing that we want to do is find seeds to be planted in there, basically our potential supporters, our potential uh, donators. Um, and as great it would, as it would be to be able to plant every single seed possible in there, it's not possible. So what I'm getting at is you have to figure out who your target audience is. You can't target everyone because then you're going to get no one. You have to find specifically who's going to fit. And like this picture, you don't have to only have one market. You can have different groups of people you want to market, as you see in the rows of different plants. But you also have to make sure that you're specifically um, targeting someone and that way you can build these long-lasting relationships and focus on them more instead of kind of doing a brief uh, focus on everyone. It's too hard to focus, get that deeper level when you're focusing on everyone. And so moving on, you find your seeds and you plant them. Uh, you want to cultivate them, water them. In words of the Institute, you like give them more information what we're working on. And eventually, the, hopefully they'll sprout. Woohoo, you got a new donor, that's great. 
you put so much energy into this new donor, uh, it would be terrible if all of a sudden they just leave or the plant dies and you have to focus on getting more donors. And so what I'm getting at with that is that once you have someone that's sprouted, someone who's actually donated, it's important that you continuously stay in contact with them and build that relationship and want them to continuously donate after that. Because it's six to seven times more expensive or more effort to get a new donor than it is to kind of keep the ones that you have. Uh, so, and those ones that keep on donating, they'll grow and they'll bloom and they'll give you more in the long run than several new donors would. So I hope that that makes sense, the whole idea of being a gardener. So moving on, sorry about the creepy photo, but mission versus our uh, mission and value. You need a good mission statement. Uh, I hope you guys all know what the mission statement is the study, of the SETI Institute is, because wherever you end up working, at, the, at least know the mission statement, because if someone were to ask you, well, what do you guys do? An easy answer would be just what your mission is. Uh, and so you need a good, concise one that's strong and to the point. I have this illustration because if you present a mission statement like the guy on the left, uh, so if the mission statement of the SETI Institute were, um, well, we look at the sky and we hope we find something, will you give us money? Um, I, as a donator, would be pretty hesitant on really looking in to figure out what exactly the Institute does. But if you have a professional, uh, concise mission statement that, like, what it is, which is to explore, understand, and explain the origin, nature, and prevalence of life, then I, as a donator, am going to be intrigued and want to know more, which gets to the next point of offering value. Once someone is interested in what you have to offer, make sure that you continuously talk to them and say, yes, your donation means something. You'll be getting value out of this. And so for the Institute, unlike several other nonprofits, it kind of takes a long time for us to, we have projects like, oh, thanks for donating. We'll let you know what happens in 10 years when that rover or that spaceship gets to where we want it to go. Um, so we need to continuously update them with newsletters, and invite them to events and say, hey, this is what's going on at the Institute. We're still waiting on that specific project, but look, look, look at what we've done already and look at what we're continuously doing. So that's the importance of having a clear mission statement and offering value. This one I love explaining. Uh, it's passion and communication. Uh, the SETI Institute scientists have so much passion for what they're doing and it gets people interested wanting to learn more because these scientists are so invested with their research. And so I've represented passion with a pumpkin. Uh, not everyone has passion, uh, but when you have passion, you have to be able to deliver it effectively. Um, if I have a pumpkin and I throw it at you, it's gonna hurt you. Um, so there's a way that you have an overly passionate person that then actually turns you away from what you're interested in. Um, I work at a burger restaurant Five Guys, and so if I'm overly passionate about it, I could go up to you and say, oh, you hate, like, you don't like Five Guys? You're an idiot. Why, why would, you obviously don't know what a good burger is that's not going to get you to want to go to Five Guys. And so that's the wrong way of using your passion. I still have that passion, but it's not effective. And so representing communication with bread, bread is the staple of your diet. Communication is the staple of an effective business. And so combining bread and pumpkin together, you get this warm, inviting product, which you want to get involved with because it's so welcoming. So with the scientists at the Institute, not only do they have this passion for the research, but they have this ability to be able to communicate what they're doing in a way that those who are not scientifically gifted will be able to understand and want to get more involved. So that's why you need that, that combination of passion, communication, and you get pumpkin bread. So the next time you have pumpkin bread, you're going to be like, wow, this is really important. And so just a conclusion, you're like, well, thank you for this wonderful uh, educational presentation, but what have you been doing here this entire time? Well, I get here pretty early, so I make the coffee in the morning. Uh, whenever they're recording anything for like the Discovery Channel, I try to sneak in behind just so I can tell my mom I made it on TV. And then, but for, for all seriousness, I'm getting to know the Institute, um, getting to know the industry, meaning what, how nonprofits work, getting to know the scientists, because these people who are seriously geniuses in my mind are actually really genuinely nice people and it's been a lot of fun to get to know them. And then getting to know about the projects, the potential projects that we might be doing, projects we've done in the past, uh, learning about social media and how we utilize that to get everyone to know what we're doing. 
And then Google, I've been looking up how to use AdWords and analytics to see how and who we're targeting. And so just, if you had to take one thing, don't forget the other variable and just talk to Frank Drake and be like, wow, I really like what you did to your equation. That's a really nice variable at the end. Uh, just remember that even though you guys are swamped with all the research that you're doing, just remember how important it is to remember that it's a business and it needs to be run as one and organized as one. So I hope you guys enjoyed my presentation. I hope you have a better understanding of exactly what I've been doing this summer. And now I'm open for any questions. Who are the most important or biggest donors to SETI? I got it. Not really sure about that. <laughs> um, uh, while I have been seeing kind of donation amounts and then we have sponsors, I don't really know who exactly the most important one is. If you want to ask Karen after the presentation, I'm sure she would know. Um, when you were talking about the acronyms, uh, the one that had threat in it, what precisely constitutes a threat? Well, it's like, uh, let's say we wanted to do a new project, a threat might be um, the market that we're entering is really big. Uh, so it, we might not actually be able to really get involved with whatever it is. So it's, it might be that the threat is we don't have a clear understanding exactly what we're doing or like exactly in that section um, what it requires to get like involved with it. So that's kind of what a threat, it's not like a physical threat. like. Watch out, because <laughs> someone's going to throw something at you if you do this. All right, hey guys, I'm Andy Crump. Hopefully you've met me by now. Um, I'm working with uh, Peter Janeskins, sitting up in the front. Um, and today I'm gonna be talking about meteors and demystifying meteors and what I've been doing this summer, essentially. So to get started, how did I get here? Um, Lauren's already talked a little bit about the Principia College and the institute he's creating there. So um, I met with him there, he was visiting and um, this was him giving a talk there recently. Um, and so I just thought, thought it sounded really cool. I applied, got in, and there you go. Um, and the picture on the top is chess club that I run to school actually too. Um, <laughs> Gabe's in it too. So it's cool. All right, so um, basically my project this summer has been working um, on, I've uh, been working with Peter Janeskins, like I said, and Bethany and Cooper a little bit. Um, and essentially we're looking at meteor light curves. So uh, every night we have 100 or so meteors that you can see um, if you wait long enough. And so what we've devised is, uh, or there's a lot of cameras in this box you can see here. We have multiple observatories around um, and they just watch the sky all night essentially and then record the data and then reduce it during the day. And Bethany will probably talk about that more when she gives a presentation in a couple weeks. Um, but yeah, this is like the setup. Um, you can see the CAMS box. Um, this is at Lick Observatory, which uh, we were just at actually. Um, and yeah, it's a pretty cool, cool idea. You can even see the garage door opener, which like kind of goes up over it and protects it during the day when it's working. Um, so why study meteors? Um, basically, there are a couple reasons you can. Meteors can actually sell for a lot, um, <laughs> I learned. So if you can find a meteor, you could be in for a lot of money. Um, but also just the scientific purposes of discovering more about um, stuff around us, asteroids and such. Um, it's just a value to be, valuable to be able to know where they came in at, what trajectory, um, and all that. So you could possibly find one. 
But even if you don't find them, because more often than not, they burn up in the atmosphere and you don't end up having something hit, um, you can measure the properties of meteors in the sky um, to see what kinds of meteors we're getting, um, and then possibly predicting impacts. Um, so we don't want to have that. Um, going back to the Drake equation, that would be the L, the longevity of our civilization. So we're trying to get that longer. That's the idea. <laughs> um, so just kind of backing up a second, what is kind of the difference between a meteor, a meteorite, asteroid, uh, all that kind of stuff? This was one of my first questions when I got here. I'm not an astronomy major. I'm a computer science major. So some of you guys might be wondering that too. Um, so I found this great little explanation on the American Meteor Society. Um, basically, a meteoroid is the thing before it kind of enters the atmosphere. It's just like a rock in the outer solar system or whatnot, or the inner solar system, and it's just kind of traveling around. Um, and then an asteroid, you've probably heard the asteroid belt is mostly the larger rocks that are um, in the, I think it's between Mars and Jupiter. Um, and then comets are further out than that. Um, and then meteors are the light as it enters the atmosphere. And so then that becomes a meteorite if it actually hits the Earth. Um, and then there's a couple more here. A fireball is just like a bright meteor. Um, and I'll talk more about that a little bit too. Um, so, um, like I said, most meteors don't hit the Earth, fortunately. Um, but occasionally when they do, if it's big enough of an impact, you can actually see it on satellite imagery like you see here. Um, and so that can help us track it down, figure out where it was. Um, and so the government releases data about uh, large fireballs um, that have been seen from many observatories. So this is the website I worked with for one of my first projects was um, essentially this website gives the like latitude, longitude, altitude, stuff like that but also gives the velocity in these XYZ coordinates, or ECEF, Earth Centered, Earth Fixed, is what it's known as. So you can see it up there, like uh, the first one that's showing is one is 12, 3.5, and negative 10.5. That's XYZ coordinates for the Earth. And so um, it's not terribly helpful as it is, um, just because it doesn't tell you where it landed or anything. It's, it's in a different unit system. So one of my first projects was uh, in C++, actually, I was writing a little program where you could enter in the values in the XYZ format, and it would calculate where it would actually hit if it did hit. Um, and then it, I figured out a way to link that with Google Maps and plot where it would go. Um, so that was just kind of a side project at the beginning. Um, but then my more main project was dealing with, uh, and I'm still working on, I'm not leaving for a couple weeks now, but uh, is dealing with these light curves. So this is just a sample light curve. Um, it's showing the six different cameras that we observe the same meteor on. Um, FP stands for Fremont Peak, LO is Lick Observatory, and SV is the Sunnyvale. Um, so those are the three main observatories we have cameras set up at. Um, and you can see how the weird shape it has, um, the left, so the, the y-axis is the flux that was measured in visual magnitudes. Um, essentially, that's compared to a bright star, Vega. So anything higher, which is going down, you'll notice, is less bright. And anything above zero, or in this case, in this case above, but like negative, is going to be brighter than Vega. So this is all darker than Vega, but it was still picked up by the cameras. Um, but you can just kind of see the weird shape. And so basically my mission for this internship has been trying to figure out information about these light curves and like the density of the meteors that cause them and such. Um, so starting out, I was dealing with, uh, we had time shifts um, and the, not all the observatories are hooked up to the internet. So there's like some time drift that occurs. So um, this was after I'd already shifted it, but basically I was looking at the height versus the time and it's, they were parallel lines, and then so I would just shift them so they were over top of each other. Um, and then from that, I could figure out the velocity um, based on the latitude, longitude, height change, stuff like that. 
Um, and you can see that it's pretty scattered at first. Um, and then this is just like a small image of how I was figuring it out. The change in height and the zenith angle from that I could figure out the distance that had traveled and then divided by the time. Um, but then the more neat of the equations is, are shown here. Basically the first one is the photometric mass. So whenever you have a meteor in the sky, you can tell how much mass it should have either based on like the light you see or um, based on what you know about the other meteors you've seen and how fast it's going. So the first type is called photometric mass and that's basically assuming that um, the amount of kinetic energy is going to be directly proportional to the amount of mass it had. Um, and the kinetic energy should correspond, or sorry, I said that wrong. The amount of kinetic energy should be proportional to the amount of light you see, because the amount of mass that's emitted is going to be shown as light. So you can see here the T is the proportion constant um, called the luminous efficiency, or the tau rather, and then the change in mass times V squared over two is uh, the kinetic energy essentially, and then I is the intensity that you observed. Um, and then the dynamic mass, um, there's just a bunch of parameters that we're, we've been tweaking, like the density is the rho, um, and the m is the mass. Um, I'm not going to go over all of those, because there are a lot, but basically you can figure out how much it should weigh, how much um, like light you should see because of what you know about just the various meters we've seen already. Um, but if people have more questions about that, I can go over it more later. But basically, this is the bulk of what I've been dealing with. Um, so a recent model, you can see the MATLAB. This is just a screenshot I took of it. Um, I was trying to match the light curve, and this is what I came up with. Um, and this is before I'd had the flares introduced. So even more recently than this, I've been also trying to match it with flares, but this one actually looks better um, because the flares get kind of messy. <laughs> but you can see it kind of jumps up after about 20 sec 21 seconds there. Um, so I'm going to be dealing with the flares because they fragment, um, and that's going to be matching that more accurately, hopefully. Um, so anyway, just uh, basic more about me, some before, like I was dealing with, uh, you know, just being a normal student, watching a lot of Netflix and stuff. But now after I've had this internship, I've been visiting observatories and such, and just <laughs> having all kinds of fun. Uh, it's great. And overall, what I've gained is learning a lot about coding in MATLAB, which is a very important tool for scientists to be able to understand. Um, learning to focus on one project uh, for a long period of time, um, not get bored, be able to keep making progress. Um, experience with astronomy, I didn't know too much about it, I know a lot more now. Um, and just exposure to like science and action. Um, all the people here are doing real hands-on science, it's really cool to see. Um, and then hearing talks like Susie's and the ones this morning and all kinds about just research that's going on now and scientists at work and then also visiting the observatories. I've seen four observatories now, um, if you include the radio observatory. Um, Bethany has two, she's smiling over there. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been a really cool experience. Um, and that's about it. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Um, can you go back to your curve with a little bump in it? Uh, yeah. Um, what do you think caused that? Um, so basically you have your big meteor ball coming in. You can think it's not that big, but for scale, for you have it coming in. <laughs> and as it goes through the atmosphere, the outer layer heats up. Uh, so like the outer shell heats up. And then once it reaches a certain temperature, which we call the glue temperature, um, we assume that there's a kind of organic substance holding the smaller particles together, the shell will break off and that will have like a big like splash of mass right away which will have also have a big light um, intensity shown. So that's kind of where the, yeah, the bump is from and the non just niceness of it.
Um, so you just mentioned uh, organic matter in the, um, in the asteroid. And just wonder, have you been able to, with your light curves, been able to detect any um, wavelengths that correspond to organic matter? Or, um, or been able to look at the uh, composition of um, the meteorites? It's more uh, speculative, I believe. Maybe Peter would know better. Um, but I'm dealing more just with the, the curves I see here. Um, The, the curve is broad, uh, broadband, broad wavelength band light. So if you're interested in organics, then basically the big question is what that glue temperature is. And that determines on what altitude you're getting these flares. So there is information there, but uh, you know we need to pull that out. <laughs> mm. When something like this goes through the atmosphere, there are certainly also electromagnetic signals that are emitted. Mm -hmm. And uh, is there any information that can be obtained by measuring the spectrum and intensity of the medium to high frequency electromagnetic waves emitted? Probably. I haven't, like I said, I haven't been dealing too much with the non-visual component, but we do have uh, spectrometers we've set up recently. We, like I've done it, uh, Peter and <laughs> yeah. other people have set up. Uh, so we're going to start uh, looking into that more too, um, which will give a broader range of the spectra. Um, but yeah, so hopefully we'll be getting more data about that soon. Because there is a famous, somewhat famous case out in history when a group of people, I think it was in Hamburg or somewhere in Northern Europe, saw a meteorite coming through and they all said, and one person said, I heard it. And everybody said, this person is nuts. But probably what that person heard was the stimulation of the inner ear mm. through the electromagnetic waves. There are tinnititis, which is known in a medical condition. So um, it's kind of, it plays a role in the discussion of at which altitude do these breakup occur, mm. which in the early 1800s, I didn't know yet. That's interesting. I, when I saw bolides, a couple at the observatory, they were, I heard sizzling in my ear. So it sounds like uh, if it was breaking up material, you, it would be popping or something, but I heard definite sizzling. This is electric stimulation. Yeah, that's great. After all these years, I know what caused that. <laughs> so there is actually quite a bit of radar work and radio stuff that's done on meteorites. But no, it's not kicking up your ear lobes. That's just acoustic modes. It's been studied. Go talk to Peter Brown and company. But don't badger, don't badger the student around. Oh, good. Oh, good. We have uh, controversy. This is me. <laughs> <laughs> and this is just kind of going By the way, the in answer to Gabe's question, too, their, their um, amino acids have been, have been discovered in meteorites. They, they actually made the first detection of radio waves from meteors uh, very recently when they started imaging the sky in radio wavelengths uh, with an array in New Mexico. So that this was published when, just when uh, Jill and Gary were trying to use ATA to look for the natural emissions of meteors. About uh, two weeks later, they had an announcement that they actually saw this in fireballs. Yeah, but this, that's, so that's brand new. <laughs> Uh, maybe uh, you can mention how many of these light curves you are about to go and analyze. Oh yeah, we have over 100,000 meteors that we've taken up over the last four, five years now. I think since 2010, so four and a half. Um, so you mentioned that the meteorites can be worth money. Have you yeah. ever had the chance to go searching for them yourself in the field? And if so, have you found any? Me, no, but Peter has for sure. Um, he went to Sudan, I believe, um, a couple of years ago and f uh, had a big search party that was in this, one of these pictures. Oh, Did that was for the back. Uh, but yeah, the, the picture on the bottom left is, I oh, believe, from his team of people in Sudan that was... Mm. 
fireball on June the second, which is brighter than the thing that uh, came down in Novato, but it also ended up very high in the atmosphere. Yeah. You want to yeah. tell about Sutter's Mill? I could say no, something. I, one of the a big a meteor the size, I guess, of a Volkswagen fell over Sutter's Mill in the Sierra Nevadas, and we all went up to look for meteor gold. It was a lot of fun. But it's interesting that it would have happened over the original gold rush where the first, you know, gold nugget was found. Okay. That's it. Thanks for okay. coming. Thank you. <laughs>
when the rock was formed. So it's, it's quite valuable. Um, it's a little disappointing. We'd hate for there to be uh, a false positive. We find oxygen, but then again, it gives us a way to determine more about the geology of the, of the planet. So going into tree potential, um, it's not completely new. We're not the first uh, group of scientists to work on it. It's been done a bit by Tony Fraser Smith and uh, Toriyama Hideo. Uh, Tony Fraser Smith uh, showed that using tree potential, uh, it could, trees could act as ultra low frequency antennas um, at the same, and had the same capabilities or better of, as high sensitivity magnetometers. And Toriyama Hideo showed that tree potentials show anomalous signals prior to earthquakes. And we actually get, we generally get around two signals, one about 14 days prior to an earthquake, and then another one around three days prior to an earthquake. So here's Tony's data. This is his tree potential up on top. And on the y-axis is the frequency, the x-axis is time. And on the bottom is the data from his magnetometer. <clears throat> so you can see they're very correlated. Um, there's actually even a little bit more data in the, uh, in the tree potential. And then Hideo showed that uh, there's anomalous signal prior to earthquakes. Um, so here are two signals that he found that we also saw in our tree data prior to, prior to an earthquake. And on the top, it's a sawtooth pattern. And on the bottom, it's this anomalous unipolar dip, which then slowly comes up in a nice even curve. So our goal is just to expand on this research. Um, so the observable effects, um, we know that the charge carriers will flow away from the stressed area and to the surface. And this creates a measurable electrical, uh, electrical potential on the, on the surface of the Earth. And there's also a magnetic field that's associated with the flow of charge. Both of these are measurable. Uh, in addition, when there's a large group of charges that arrive to the surface, there's some air ionization. And then when these charge carriers settle down, there's thermal emission, which we can hopefully uh, get from satellite data. And so, like I said earlier, what we expect to see are unipolar dips and a sawtooth pattern. Um, and in this animation, I'm just going to explain it. So this is our diagram. Here's our tree. And right over here, you can see we have our voltmeter. Our top electrode is positive, and our bottom electrode is negative. Then, with tectonic stress, we have an arrival of a positive charge, which then makes this bottom electrode turn more positive than the top electrode. So, if there, so as a precursor for the signal, we should see um, our potential reverse polarity before an earthquake. So, getting into our data, finally, we have 105 days of data taken between mid-December and beginning of April. This was taken in Boulder Creek, uh, just north of Santa Cruz, and we used a redwood tree. So what we found was that the general behavior of the tree um, varies throughout the seasons, and as seasons transition, we tend to get a lot of random noise, which makes looking for anomalous signals very difficult. We see strong correlation with temperature and humidity, and we see smoother signals when there's uh, more consistent light, uh, stranger signals when there's cloud cover. We are also fortunate enough to have um, some nearby earthquakes, so less than 300 miles away. And we see strange signals before then. Uh, we see frequencies correlating with tidal cycles. Um, now this would be, uh, this wouldn't be ocean tides, this would actually be land tides, where the uh, gravitational force of the sun and the moon are able to lift the Earth's crust uh, somewhere between 5 and 30 centimeters. Um, but it's on the same frequency as um, ocean and lunar cycles. And we also see some random signals, which we don't know if that's regular tree behavior or noise. So here's our raw data. Um, as you can see at the beginning, we have a nice consistent pattern. Um, and we see that again towards the end right there. And then about mid-February, when the seasons start to shift, we see this crazy roller coaster of tree potential going up and down. So running a Fourier analysis on this, we were able to get certain periods. Um, the highlighted periods, excuse me, highlighted periods are harmonic overtones. So they are basically products um, of these two frequencies. 
so they're not independent frequencies. Um, but what we do see are 15 and half a day periods, which correlate with tidal cycles, which seems to suggest that the trees are picking up uh, potential due to the Earth's crust moving uh, on tidal and lunar cycles, which is very encouraging. So now getting into earthquakes, within the duration that we were taking our data, we had four earthquakes. They're right here, and that's where our tree was. They were between 100 and 300 miles from the epicenter, our tree was, and we get some unique sign uh, signatures, uh, un mainly unipolar dips and sawtooth patterns. And obviously the stronger and or closer the earthquake is, the stronger a signal we get. Really anything below magnitude five is very hard to distinguish signals between the, uh, between the pattern of the tree. So here are the earthquakes relative to our tree potential. And we have uh, magnitude 4.1, 4.3, 4.5, and we are fortunate enough to have a much larger earthquake, magnitude 6.8. So here's our first earthquake. It's our most powerful one. It happened in Northern California. The epicenter was actually in the ocean. It's about 300 miles away um, from our tree. And as you can see right here, we see a giant unipolar dip where our potential actually goes down below zero for a short amount of time. And then it's relatively quiet. We see somewhat of a normal pattern, but there's, lots, but there's a sawtooth pattern incorporated in that. And then one day before the earthquake, uh, we see this large trough which forms, um, which is very strange. It's uh, not seen anywhere else in, the, in our tree potential data. So we believe that's correlated with the earthquake. And then the red dot represents when the earthquake struck. So to really determine if these were outliers, we did some statistical analysis. Um, and what this does is it just takes an 18-day window um, and looks at any outlying points, which are two standard deviations away from the mean. So as we can see, those unipolar dips that we saw earlier are outliers, and there's also outliers associated with that trough. So we have a lot of good evidence to assume that these signals um, are precursor signals to the earthquake, which hit on March 9th in Northern California. Unfortunately, we also, um, the other earthquakes we had, unfortunately, were much smaller. Uh, so we weren't able to get a very good signal, and it was a lot harder to distinguish that from the, from the uh, patterns of the trees. So here we have the red dot right there represents when the earthquake struck and the green represents the outlying data. Um, it's hard to see whether or not this is just random noise or it's actually a signal. Um, and this continues for our other bits, uh, for our other earthquakes as well. This was actually taken during a time when there was a very, very random pattern. So again, very hard to distinguish uh, signals from the earthquake and signals from the tree. And again, we have, this is actually the first unipolar uh, pulse associated with the large magnitude earthquake. Um, and we have this smaller unipolar pulse right before this smaller magnitude 4.1 earthquake. So, so our problems with our data, um, as I mentioned before, the biological process of the tree gets into the way. Um, it's hard to distinguish what the uh, signals of the tree and signals of the earthquake and we're also extrapolating from one data point. We only have one tree. Uh, to have this be of any statistical significance, we should really have a whole array of trees. Then we can look at correlations between uh, correlations with the signal and determine if that's actually, uh, if there's anomalous signal associated with an earthquake. Also, if we are going to use this, uh, if we are going to create a network of earthquake sensors, we need to make sure that it works on more than one type of tree. Right now, we're only using redwoods. And as you know, redwoods cannot be found around the world. So we're hoping to expand our search, connect up different species of trees, and see how they um, see what their behavior is. We also have a really short data period. So we have 100 days, roughly. And that's uh, over a time when the seasons change, which will not give us a very uh, consistent tree pattern. So ideally, we'd have something more like two years or 700 days worth of data. And lastly, there aren't very many nearby or powerful earthquakes, which is good for the inhabitants of Boulder Creek, 
Uh, unfortunately for our data, that doesn't tell us very much. So what we need are uh, more sensors, more trees, more time, and more earthquakes. So our game plan for this research, um, on July 23rd, we actually installed six surface potential sensors, or fake trees, as we like to call them. And we installed these at HeartMath. And what these do is they provide uh, the surface potential relative to varying depths in the ground. And we also wired up another redwood tree, this time putting a greater height in between electrodes, which will tell us how the height affects the signal. And we have plans to hook up an oak tree. Now, our biggest, um, our biggest obstacle in this, as Susie uh, brilliantly mentioned before, is financial, financial obstacles. Uh, obstacles. So we essentially need to have real-time data analysis and data acquisition. All of that costs money, um, but we are still slowly but surely going ahead with this project. And the last project that I will be, uh, that I'll be involved in while I'm here in California is activating charge carriers with UV light. Then hopefully when I'm back at the University of Minnesota, um, I'll be able to wire up some trees and see how uh, see how trees perform uh, in an urban environment that's very, very cold. So just to go in, a little bit of information about the fake trees. This is uh, essentially what it is. It's a grounding rod that's insulated except for the bottom. Um, that gives us the potential at, the, at a certain depth. And then on the surface of the ground, there is wire mesh. And then we attach a voltmeter to the grounding rod and to the wire mesh and collect data. So here's an example of one of the arrays we have set up. This should give us the ability to measure uh, surface charges without any biological interference. We're hoping that this will validate the use of trees as earthquake sensors. And this should tell us more about the behavior of the positive hole charge carriers. So we're able to get this up and running uh, two days after we installed it. Uh, currently, we have three days worth of data. Um, so we have three different uh, surface potential meters um, and a meter hooked up to the tree. And as you can see here, uh, they're all operating at around the same frequency, which is a very good thing. Um, some of them, some of, the or some of the waves seem to be slightly out of phase. Um, but as you can see, we're getting similar responses to all the channels and the tree. So, so far so good, but of course we'll need a longer duration to really be able to determine whether or not there's strong correlation. And for the last experiment, which hopefully will take place Monday, uh, I'm going to, or Friedemann, Jackie, and I are going to take rock dust and then radiate it with UV light and see if that can activate the charge carriers and create a current. So this is the setup right here. Anyway. So this is set up right here, and it's an analog for the lunar surface. Uh, what we expect to find is that uh, the lunar dust or lunar rock will have lots of peroxy defects and will be activated by the UV light from the sun. Um, and then charge should flow from the sunny side of the moon to the shady side of the moon. So that's what we hope to do here. So we're going to use a welding arc to emit UV light to a portion of our rock dust, and then we'll be measuring the current flow from the radiated side of the rock to the unradiated side of the rock. And we'll also get the conductivity and electrical potential of that as well. So, so in conclusion, with the experiment, we're going to expand our data collection. Uh, we're going to have more trees, longer duration, and different parameters, including different species of trees and looking at ground surface potential. We've seen really good evidence that trees are ultra low frequency uh, antennas and that they can detect earthquake precursor signals. What I learned through this internship, um, I learned a lot of signal analysis, and I got to work a lot with MATLAB, um, and Friedemann uh, always kept me learning with many of his geochemistry lectures. So, Before I conclude, I'd just like to give thanks to uh, one Jonathan Langton. He's a physics professor at Principia College, who I worked a lot with um, over the summer. I would Skype in whenever I had a question. He was always very helpful. I'd like to thank Andy Crump, my good friend, Lawrence Doyle for helping put on the Institute of Metaphysics of Physics. 
I'd like to thank Friedman Freund uh, and the army of interns working on the earthquake detection. And I would also like to thank Principia College. So now if anyone has any questions. Did you try to correlate your uh, earthquake signals with bright meteor fireballs? No, I did not. <laughs> Um, as the potential builds up with the UV dust experiment, is there going to be enough potential, do you think, to observe any dust movement? Um, we don't have anything set up to observe that. We've also uh, wet down the dust to make sure it's, there's a lot of surfa surface contact with the individual dust particles. Okay. Um, the fake sensor, like the non-tree sensors that you set up, mm -hmm. um, is that just to be able to, to subtract uh, what would normally be there, like to, to subtract the biological from the trees? Like why wouldn't you just use those all the time instead of trees? Um, well, we, I believe using the fake trees or surface, uh, surface potential sensors is pretty unique. I don't believe it's been done before. Um, as far as the theory of the charge hole carriers, that um, is not well understood by the rest of the scientific community. Um, so they, uh, it probably has not occurred to anyone yet to do that. Um, so we, our process of, th of thinking has gone from, oh, well, trees have clearly shown interesting signals prior to earthquakes. Let's go there. And then we moved on to setting up the fake trees, which uh, we expect to get similar signals. Yeah, Gabe, my wonderful presentation. Thank you. And also, thanks for all the summer work that you did. And my um, just for the general audience, one more factor that we did not take into account, because we don't have enough data, is that we also expect interferences from geomagnetic storms, because they affect uh, what happens in the Earth's crust. So these are still another set of parameters that we have to try to keep track of in order to understand the signals. And uh, also, as you may have guessed, in the tree, you have, like Gabe indicated, you get the arrival of the positive charge, but then you get a negative signal because the, trun the further transport through the tree trunk is through electrochemical transport, electrolytical transport. While in the fake trees, we just have a metal rod so we don't have this interference or change of the signal by another uh, electrical transport mechanism to be uh, taken into account. And we can work in deserts if we have that. So it's going to work fine. And also thanks, Gabe, for considering putting some screws in some trees in Minnesota. <laughs> Absolutely. And by the way, I worked with a guy that uh, did impact studies into lunar rocks. There's a lot of lunar dust around that's not being used if you guys want to get some. <laughs> oh, you have to mail it back in an envelope. That's what you have to do. You had to mail back envelopes of dust. Okay, let's thank Gabe again and thank everybody.